So today, we are considering more than conquerors. And when you look at that slide, what is the issue you have with it? What's the problem you have with that slide? What's the problem you have with the title? It's a question, right? More than conquerors should be a statement, but it's a question. And it's not a question because, of the, because we aren't more than conquerors. It's not a question mark there because God doesn't say that we are more than conquerors, but it's a question mark because we struggle to believe that we're more than conquerors. And over the last while, God has been moving me from a place where I've been struggling to believe that I am more than a conqueror, where I'm struggling to believe what Jesus says about me. And what we're going to discuss are the principles that he has brought to help to move me from that place to where I again accept what he says and then live it out. Okay? What is amazing about us is how sometimes it's very hard for us to accept what Jesus says, but the devil will come along and say one thing and we accept it right away. Jesus tells us this is who we are, and we're like, God, how could that be who I am? The devil comes along, and he says, you're, you're not worth anything. And all of a sudden, we accept it right away. And we believe what the devil says right away. And so the challenge of the Christian experience is to not let the devil's opinion and our opinion of ourselves supersede God's opinion of ourselves. And it's not easy. Honestly, for the last couple of months or so, it has not been easy for me. It has not been easy for me to wrap my mind around all of these things that God says and then to appropriate them and to live them out. For specific reasons, it's not been easy. How many of you confess your sin genuinely and then after you confess it, you still feel guilty and then you confess it again? How many of you do that? You know why? Because God says at that point when you confess, you know what you are? Forgiven. That's heaven's account. But our account is, I don't feel forgiven, so I'm not going to act forgiven. And so we act like we're not forgiven when heaven has said, when you confess, you are forgiven. And it's the same thing with more than conquerors. Heaven's made a declaration and said, because of Jesus Christ, this is you. And we've said, oh. I just can't believe that that's me. <laughs> and because we've said we can't believe it, we can't then appropriate it and we can't live it out. And so rather than the world seeing more than conquerors, they're seeing people who look conquered. And it's a sad thing. When heaven has done something for you, when heaven has completed the work to cause you to be this, that we will decide, having been given this, to live a different way. So tell me, in your experience, what are some of the reasons that it becomes difficult for you to sometimes believe what heaven has to say about you? What are some of the reasons? What was that? Doubt. Doubt, yeah. Helplessness. What else? Shame. Sin. Yes, big one. Circumstances, yes. Pain, yeah. So before we get to Romans 8, which is where we're going to end, we're going to look at four reasons. Four reasons we struggle with uh, this whole thing. All right? Four reasons why it's hard for us to believe what Jesus says about us. Number one, I'm not where I want to be. My circumstances. It is amazing for me how I could have my life pretty much in order, or God could have my life pretty much in order, but I have, may have one thing that's not in order, and I can fixate on that one thing and feel like my life is not in order. And it is also pretty much amazing to me how much I need my life in, to be in order in order for me to believe Jesus. Again, this is not saying we shouldn't be... Um, we shouldn't have any feelings about our circumstances. We shouldn't. But it is amazing. See, see here's the equation in, 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 in faith world. And that is, you believe, and then the evidence of what you believe is seen. 
We do it backwards. God, I want to see the evidence of what you say about me, and then I'll believe that this is who I am. And God is saying, this is faith. You believe. Once you believe and you appropriate it and you, and you actually get it down deep in your soul, then what happens is the evidence comes out, and the evidence comes out despite your circumstances. Look, we're going to Judges chapter 6, a man named Gideon. It says, the angel of the Lord came um, and sat down under the oak in Oprah. That's a place, not a person, that belonged to Joash and Abby is right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So here's Gideon's circumstances. He is doing a job that he would typically do outside, inside, because if he did it outside, the Midianites might see him come and take everything that he is. So the people are now, this is Judges, where they go through a cycle where they sin, and then they're oppressed, and then they're rescued. So he is doing a job in, inside, they would normally do outside, so the Midianites wouldn't see him. His circumstances are he is hiding because the, the, the people are under oppression. And then it says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you. And then he called Gideon something, mighty warrior. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never seen a mighty warrior hiding from his enemies, right? So God shows up and says, Gideon, I know what your circumstances are, but I'm telling you, God is with you and you're a mighty warrior. Now, let me ask you a question. Was he saying that based on Gideon's circumstances? No. Because Gideon's circumstances suggested that he was something other than what the angel of the Lord called him. Right? But the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Gideon, I'm telling you, based on what I know from heaven, that is who you are. Right? Now, here's the significance of this. You know the importance of understanding that little statement that says the Lord is with you? Like, this is such a significant statement that we, that we struggle with, and it should make all the difference. Who is with you should make all of the difference. Matter of fact, in Psalm 23, it speaks about the valley of a shadow of death, and then it says when you walk through it, he is with you. It says you may be in a circumstance that looks like death, but the most significant thing is he is with you. Now, I've used this example before, but imagine, right, I am, I am about to play, um, forgive me, okay, I'm about to play basketball, and on that side is Giannis, how do you say his last name? They call him the Greek freak, right? You should see this man, his seven-something muscular, and he's just... Right? LeBron James, and who else is good? No, I'm about to use you, but not. not. <laughs> who? And Steph Curry. So those three guys are standing there. I'm, I'm, I'm standing here, and the only people I have with me are Pastor Joe and Aaron. All right? <laughs> And so I'm looking over there, and I'm seeing who I'm about to, who I'm about to uh, play against, and I'm looking behind me, and I'm going. <laughs> now, imagine, though, standing behind me was Sh Shaquille O'Neal, when he was fit and good, <laughs> and Michael Jordan in his prime. Now, I look at them, and I go, I'm oh, no, not good as any of you, but I know who is with me. Right? And because of who's with me, I now walk on the court with a completely different attitude. I'm like, come on, you guys, let's go. We can do this. But if I had those two fellas and me, I'm not just talking about them, I'm talking about me too. If I had those two fellas and me, I would be looking, I'd be walking on that court going, just get this over with. Right? But what changes everything is not what's over there, it is what who is with me? And here's what God says about you. Wherever you find yourself, whether it's in a sh the valley of a shadow of a death, I am with you. Do you 
know what difference it makes for my daughter to understand that me and Marshall are with her? You know what a difference it makes? You know what a difference it makes in a lot of children's lives when they don't have that understanding about their parents? Just they don't feel secure. Or they struggle dealing with the world. So we need to understand that our Father is with us. Now look what Gideon says. He says, pardon me, Lord. Gideon replied. And this is what we often say to God when he tells us we're more than a conqueror. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonder, wonders that our ancestors told us about? When they said, did not the Lord bring you up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. So here's what happens. Heaven shows up and says, Gideon, God's with you. You're a mighty warrior. Gideon rejects heaven's report. And I don't know how many times in my Christian experience I have rejected heaven's report. And I have walked around acting like heaven is a liar and my circumstances are the truth. Now, my circumstances are my truth, just like Gideon's circumstances were his truth. But when heaven shows up and says something in your circumstances, it is the truth. It is the truth. And we can walk in it. Okay? Second thing is my state. I'm not who I want to be. All right, I'm going to need you two again. I'm sorry. So, Pastor Joe, can you come first? So there are two gaps that we look at in our Christian experience. You can stand over there, right? So Pastor Joe, the gap between me and Pastor Joe is who I am right now in my Christian experience, that's who I want to be. Do you know how many times I look at this gap and get discouraged? That's who I want to be, right? And there's a gap between who I want to be in Christ and who I am right now. And I'm constantly looking at this gap. Going, how can I close it? It seems I've been saved for 20-something years, and it seems like the gap get, is getting bigger. And this is how we operate in our, in our thoughts. But there's another gap we never look at. Right? <laughs> go a little further, go a little further. Okay, so we have this separate in the second service, so I don't have to. Okay, there's another gap that we hardly ever look at that should encourage us. That's who I used to be. That's who I was the day I got saved. Right? I, I, I hardly ever look at this gap of what God has done to be encouraged in my faith. I keep looking at this one and getting discouraged. So God says... This is your state. This is where you are. You're not who you want to be, but you're not who you used to be. And the reason you're not who you used to be is because of what I have done in your life. Be encouraged by it. And then, when you're encouraged by it, look what Philippians says. Here's what you do. You say this. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press. Here's what God says. Your state is this. Your goal is Jesus. The gap will always exist. But you press. You press. This gap should not discourage you. You know why it should not discourage you? Because your goal is Jesus. This gap will always be there until you die. Now, you should see growth. You should see progress. But the gap will always remain. It should not be the thing that stops you from moving on for Christ. Paul says, I haven't attained it, but I press to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me for. Brothers and sisters, do not, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I haven't taken hold of it yet. But one thing I do, I forget what's behind me, and that's not... To, he's not talking about the wonderful things that Jesus has done. He's talking about your past, which we're going to get to in a little while. I forget those things, and I strain towards what is ahead. Press on toward the goal, to win the prize, who is God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
This gap will always exist. It's verse 2. Because the girl is Christ. Right? But don't let the gap discourage you. Press and see what God does. And then look at this gap. Look at this gap. I remember who I, who I was when I got saved. I'm not that dude anymore. If I was, Marshall Lewis would have never married me. I, I, and, and none of you would have ever wanted to know me. I'm telling you, see this and be encouraged in the Lord. Thank you very much. Third thing. I can't forget who I was. So there are some things in my past that I have done. And because I can't forget them, I struggle to believe that I'm more than a conqueror. For this, we go back to Gideon. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. So go and say, am I not sending you? And Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Here's my resume. And my family is the least, right? So the angel of the Lord now gives Gideon an assignment, and Gideon says, here's my past. Moses did the same thing, right? Here's my past. Here's my ability, right? So the angel of the Lord shows up and calls, calls Moses deliverer, and Moses goes, what? Me? And that's what we often say. Who? Me? Understand something. God sees us in light of Jesus Christ, and he sees us prophetically. That is, in light of where he has taken us. When he called Gideon a mighty warrior, he saw where he was taking Gideon. Okay? We see ourselves and others based on our history. As a matter of fact, that's how we make decisions about future potential or what you'll do in the future. We look at a thing called a resume, right? Somebody hands me a resume. I look at who they have been, and I say, well, they're not going to be able to be this because of who they have been. That is not how God operates. Here's what God does. This is the cool thing. I mean, look at Paul. God looks at your resume and says, man, yours is terrible. Wouldn't it be amazing if then you get saved and then your whole life changes and then we, me and you together, we begin to write a new story on the backdrop of your resume. Like on the backdrop of all this mess. I come in, I save you. Some of, somebody messed around you, you might still stay, but how you operate, how you think, how you walk is completely different. What a testimony that is. He looks at your resume and says, this is an awesome person to make into a testimony for myself. We look at our resume often and are discouraged by it. We see ourselves. Historically, God sees us prophetically. And then the last one. I'm not what I want to be, my sin. So here we are as Christians. We want to, we're looking at the gap. We want to press. Then we do something that God calls sin. Right? And it's almost like, no, this is, nothing in Scripture is an is a, um, invitation to sin. Matter of fact, it's a love motivator not to. When God forgives us, it's a love motivator for us not to sin, okay? So um, it's almost like I believe, right, that um, for me to be more than a conqueror, that can't be present at all in my life. Now, it should, if it, it, God says it's always going to be present, but again, there should be growth, there should be progress. That's not what I'm talking about, right? And we feel like sometimes we get rebuked by God because we are a failure, you get rebuked by God because you are his child. It's when he stops rebuking you, then you have an issue. Think about your child. If your child's doing something crazy, like, and you, you, the reason you show that you love them is you rebuke them. You tell them, stop, because if you go down this road, something bad's going to happen to you. 
You know when your child has an issue? When you stop rebuking them and letting them go. And God does that sometimes. He says, look, this, these people are getting so messed up. I'm just going to leave them to their own devices and watch, watch what happens. That's the place we never want to get. So listen. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then, the verse that we all love, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What preceded that verse? What preceded verse 9? Verse 8, which says that if we, compl- if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, again, this is not an invitation to sin. Why did God put, us, put that in there? He put that and verse 9 because he knew that we would sin. Again, we're supposed to see growth. We're supposed to see progression. One of the things that you have to come to grips with if you are going to be more than a conqueror is to understand that you are not without sin. Again, it's not an invitation to sin. But I have to understand something about me. I'm not without sin. <clears throat> and so... This is why when we confess our sin, we can't accept his forgiveness because our pride tells us, I can't believe I did that. Look at me. I should be, able, I should be better. I should. And it's all focused on us. And God's saying, I forgive you. Now focus on Jesus because his, his man forgiveness is possible. But you know why we can't accept his forgiveness? Because we're focused on us. Amen. I can't believe how much in the last couple of months I've been focused on me. Wallowing in my pity and Right? So, he says, if we claim to... And then, you know what? This is something I saw about this verse, I think, for the very first time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and what? Whenever God forgives me, I think it's his mercy and grace. But you know what that tells me? It is just for him to forgive me. If I went to a legal system and God was there and he forgave me, it's not just his mercy and grace, but it is his justice as well. So when he forgives me, Because he has punished Christ, it is just for him to forgive me. That's not, again, that's not an invitation to sin. Once you wrap your mind around this, this should be an invitation to go out and not sin anymore. Like it should be motivation that says, how can somebody take my punishment, forgive me? It should cause you to not want to sin. Then it says, if he, and then look what it's, it's surrounded by it, that verse. Look, if we claim to have not sinned, We make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. Now, all of these things, all of these reasons we just gave for us struggling to accept that we're more than conqueror, reject the only reason that we are more than a conqueror. And that's who Jesus is. They all reject that and they focus on us. Here is the point that God gave to me this week to really help me understand this and to allow him to move me to where I need to go. Whenever Satan comes up to tell you that you are, more than, more, more than, you are not more than a conqueror, he focuses on you, right? Right? Look at you. You did that. You said that. You thought that. You, and you, you, then you go, okay, I can't be more than a conqueror. But if Satan is going to convince you that you're, more than, you're not more than a conqueror, you know what he has to convince you of? He has to convince you about facts about Jesus because that's the reason you're more than a conqueror. So Satan comes up and he says, look at you, look at you. But imagine if you said this, yeah, but Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is risen. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is always with me. Jesus is redeeming me. Jesus is delivering me. Satan, can you prove that these things aren't true? Because that's what me being more than a conqueror is based on. He convinces you stuff about you that you should already know. You're not without sin. There is going to be a gap. Your circumstances aren't always going to be perfect because Jesus said in this world you would have trouble. All of those things Jesus told us we should know. And he comes and he repeats them, and then we believe them, and then we take it on and say, well, I can't be that. 
Well, the reason you're that is because Jesus died, because he rose again, because he says it, because he is Savior, because he is all-powerful. So if Satan wants to convince me that I'm not more than a conqueror, he needs to come to me and prove to me that Jesus isn't those things. Because that's the reason I am more than a conqueror. It's not because my circumstances are perfect. It's not because my past was perfect. It's not because I don't sin. It's not because I'm exa not exactly where I, I want to be in my Christian experience. None of those things make me more than a conqueror. If my circumstances were perfect, I am no more than a conqueror than I am if they are not. And so if he shows up and talks to me about that, I need to tell him, hey, the only reason I'm more than a conqueror is Jesus, so prove to me that Jesus isn't who he said he was. And you know what he would do? Shut up. Because he can't. Because he can't. And what Jesus is trying to do for me is to say, stop looking at you because, because all of those things are true about you. But look at me because I am the reason you are more than a conqueror. So he knows he can't convince me anything about Jesus. So what he does is he keeps focusing on me. And here's the thing. I don't make me more than a conqueror. So why do I accept this from him? I'm more than a conqueror because of Christ. We struggle to th see things, including ourselves, from heaven's perspective. But we remain primarily invested and firmly anchored in the physical realm. This is the struggle, okay? There's heaven... And then there's where we live, right? And we are rooted here often. Like, we are rooted here. So all of our concepts, all of our, value, all of our thoughts and stuff are rooted here. And heaven, you know how much of the Bible is trying to convince you of what heaven says is true? Honestly, you go through the Bible. Paul always writing things like this, like... Um, you, you need to be convinced, or I write these things so that you would know. Um, all of these things, look, um, set your mind on things above. Your present sufferings are nothing compared to where you're, the glory of where you're going. God has given you everything you need. The weapons that we fight with are carnal. You're more than a conqueror. All of those things are heaven trying to get you to live on earth with heaven's point of view. And it's not easy. It is not easy. Because the earth that we live in is, is part of its job with Satan as the God, the God, as little g of this world. Part of its, its, what it does is to convince us that heaven's view is crazy. This is part of what this world is trying to do. And if you look at what's happening in this world, um, and this is why the Bible actually says this. I mean, it says this. It says that in the end times, it says, look, even this is going to be so powerful that even it could, if it could, it would even confuse and cause the elect to walk away. Right? So Satan's doing a good job out there now of convincing the world that what God says is crazy. Right? And, and the world is taking it on. Like, they gobbled it up. But what's happening is now is coming into the church and some people in the church are still starting to gobble it up. So here's the thing. God says this. This is such an important verse. Therefore, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. Now here's what this means, Right? It means that when we're on the earth, the things that we see, right, a lot of the, thi a lot of the things that we're going to see are going to be contrary and are going to challenge our faith. This is what God is telling you. While you are on this earth, you're going to see things that challenge your faith. You're going to experience things that challenge your faith. But which do you live by, faith or sight? Then he says this, we are confident, I say. And would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So now we're going to make a transition to look at Romans chapter 8. So a conqueror is a person who conquers or vanquishes a victor, right? Somebody who wins. The Bible comes along and says, that's not you. You're not just somebody who wins. You're actually more than that. 
You're not just somebody who wins. You're more than that. That's what the Bible says about us, right? Now, just like Gideon, there are times in our lives where we feel like we're losing, right? And we have to understand that when the Bible says that we are more than that, it includes all of those times, okay? Now, here's why I believe the Bible says that. If two people, that's good, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so if two people enter a fight, right? So you got me here. And then somebody over here. So these two people are going to enter a fight, right? And I look out at you and I say, who's going to win, right? Some of you might say, me. Hopefully all of you will say, me. Some of you might say, based on what you see in the other person, it's like David and Goliath, right? We, we, we look, we assess it, and we say, this person's going to win, this person's going to win, this person's going to win, right? And when they start, both of them have the potential to win, right? At the end of it, there's going to be one conqueror. If they fight three times, it might be... Two times one is a conqueror, one time the other one is. But can I tell you something about us? We enter a fight, and we've already won. Like, we enter the fight, and although it looks like we may lose small battles along the way in the war, we've already won. Like, losing is not even an option. We have won because Jesus has won. So, whilst I'm going to enter some battles, and it might even look like I lose some while I'm on this earth, here's the fact, ultimately... I can't lose because Jesus cannot lose. So I'm more than a conqueror because the conquering's already been done. Already been done. So it's an unfair fight. It's like me fighting Aaron. Clearly Aaron's going to lose. It's unfair. It's completely unfair. Every enemy who wages war against the church it's an unfair fight, even though it looks like they may be winning. It is unfair. They've already lost. They've lost. I don't care what it looks like, sight. Faith tells me they've already lost, and therefore I am more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. <laughs> you know what I was thinking this week? There is no such thing as an ordinary Christian. All of you people aren't ordinary. You are extraordinary in Christ. You're extraordinary in Christ. There are things about you that Christ has given you that come from heaven that are just superior. We're extraordinary people. We're more than conquerors. Nothing can separate us from his love. All of these things are true. Now, let's look at these verses. I have so enjoyed, I've read these verses so many times this week. Because what these eight verses are is Paul coming to the end of Romans chapter 8. I submit the greatest chapter in the whole Bible. I mean, here's why it starts. It starts after Romans chapter 7 where Paul is saying, all of this stuff, how bad he is. I can't do this. I, I keep doing this. I mess up. I mess up. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, now there is no more condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, it's, it starts there and it builds. And you know what, what the verses we're going to look at? It's almost like Paul gets to the end of it and the truth of what he has just written is so overwhelming that the last eight verses are just Paul bursting out in prayers. Like it's like, this stuff's amazing. I'm writing this and I can't believe how awesome this is. And he gets to, he gets, um, to, to, to verse 31 and he asks all of these questions, but all of them, all of them to me are just him saying, this is awesome. Now, here's how he begins. What then, we, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did, did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how who we not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? We are more than conquerors because of who is for us. Mm. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, here's what that verse means. It doesn't mean that we're not going to experience any opposition, okay? That's not what it means. It means... If God has secured your salvation, if God has 
has um, made it such that heaven is your home, if God has given you all that you need in Christ Jesus, who then can realistically come against you and take any of the most significant things that you have away from you? Nobody. All the devil can do is make you think you don't have all of these things in Christ. But he can never actually take them away, right? So we are more than conquerors because of who is for us, right? Now, he's not just with us. And I think it was a couple of months ago I talked about it. He's not just with us, but he's for us. Do you know when my daughter, you know what I, I noticed over the last couple of weeks? My daughter constantly asks me for things that are impossible for her to accomplish on her own, right? So she say, like even a simple thing like this, we have cups, but the way up her, daddy, can you get a cup for me, right? She asks me that because she can't accomplish it on her own. But she also asks me these things because she knows that I am with her and for her. She don't, you don't ask questions like this of somebody who you believe is against you, Right? She asked me because she knows that I love her and I am with her and I am for her. So whenever she asks me, she asks me in confidence based on, my, based on the character that she knows to be with me and also the history that we have together. So she's like, Daddy, um, this is really, I, I, can you? She asked me for um, help with her math homework. She asked me for, you know, for the things in her life and all of that. And she does it because she understands who is with her and who is for her. We need to understand who is with us and who is for us. we got to understand. Because it is one of the reasons, one of the ways in which we become more than a conqueror. I have told you these things. Now, this is some stuff about the person who is with us and for, her, for us. I have told you these things so that in the world you may have peace. In this world you have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Listen. The person who is with you and for you has overcome the world. He's overcome hell, death, and the grave. He's also overcome all of his enemies and yours already. This is a description of the person who is with you and for you. He's already an overcomer, and he's overcome all of those things. Secondly, look how this translates to us. 1 John chapter 4. You, dear children, are from God... And have what? Why? Because you're from God. You've overcome them. Because the one who is, here's the reason. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Then look what it says. This, this is skipped on to verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the, way, on the day of judgment. In this world... We, this is what the world, this is what the Bible says about me. In this world, we are like Jesus. That's in the Bible. Now, immediately when I read that, when we read that, what do we do? What's the first thing you say? What's the first thing you say? Me? Me? How could that be possible? Well, go back up. It's possible because you are from God and the one who is in you, in you, in you, right? It's possible because of Christ. I read these verses and I'm like, that can't be true. And God says, I said they're true, not because of you, but because of my son. Man, we need to get to a place where we look at Jesus. Because I'm tired of looking at myself. It exhausts me. I'm tired of looking at all of these things, all oh, my inconsistencies, you know, my stomach getting flat, then it coming back, getting flat, coming back, over and over again. All of these things that happen in my life, I'm tired of me. I'm inconsistent. But there is a God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. And, and, and what God is doing for me over the last is t causing me to understand how much of the decisions you take, how much of how you see yourself is based on you, and how little of it is based on him. Because if it was based on him, there would be some places where you would be speaking boldly for me. Now, 
Now in him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. The one who is with you is at work in you. The one who is with you and for you is at work in you. Say it with me. He's at work in me. Oh, okay, wait a minute. One, two, three. He's at work in me. Now say it like you mean it. He's at work in me. He is at work in you. He's not just with you and for you. You can be like Jesus because he is at work in you. Do you know how often Jesus is at work in you? 24 hours. Of, Jesus is at work in you when you're sleeping. You're unconscious. He's always at work in you. Always. And here's the struggle. Paul, again, Romans chapter 7. I see this at work in me. And it's talking about sin, right? But then at the end of it, he says, but thanks be to God who rescues me from this body of sin. Okay? Then it says this, look. To him be your glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So the one who is with you, has already, already overcome hell, death, and the grave, all your enemies. He's overcome this world, right? So that makes you an overcomer. And then it says, the one who is with you is also at work in you. Number two, we're more than a conquerors because of how he gives. It says first that he didn't spare his son. Right? So here's what Jesus says. Think about this scenario, how stupid this would be. Let's say, let's say Ray was about to start a, a business, right? And he came to me, and I had $500,000 in my account. He said, I need help starting a business. I said, Ray, take the 500000 right? I'm giving you the best that I have, right? He starts the business. He's working it hard, but some issues come up, Right? He comes back to me and he says, you, you know, I know you have some knowledge on this. What do you think I should do? I said, I'm not helping you now. You're on your own. I've invested everything I have to start it. And now when he comes back, I'm telling him he's on his own. This is how we think Jesus is. He invested everything in us by giving us his son to die. And now we think when it comes to our life, our marriage, our this, our that, he says, Go back, you're on your own. I don't want to help you. But here's what the verse says. I invested everything in you, and now I am there to help you, and I will give to you graciously. This is who God is. He invested everything so that we could be his children, and because he is so invested, there is no way he's going to turn his back on us. Who will bring this? Is, now we go on. Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. <laughs> we are more than conquerors because the only person who can bring a rightful charge against us died for us and justifies us. The only person who can bring a rightful charge against you is Jesus, and he bears in his body the marks of your salvation. So other people can bring a charge. They can say, you know, you shouldn't have done this, and it, it could be right, right? But they can't bring a charge with regard to your salvation, the fact that heaven's your home. Nobody can bring a charge like that, a rightful charge against you. And the only person who can bring judgment on me bore my judgment. The only person who can rightfully bring judgment on me bore my judgment in his body. The one who is going to judge me in the future is the same one who died in my place and is my lawyer before the Father right now. So how can anybody bring a charge against me? And this is why we are more than a conqueror. So it says, who will bring a charge? Can God bring a charge? 
Who then is the one who condemns? Is it Jesus? No. He died for you. We are more than conquerors because nothing can separate us from his love. He goes on and he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? Now here's the thing. He's saying all of these things will exist, right? Or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death. Look, look, what, is, look what is writing here. All day long, and we consider, and we're considered as sheep led to the slaughter. So he says, who can possibly separate us from the love of Christ? And then he gives us a list. So we are more than conquerors because nothing can ever separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. There is no doubt in heaven as to who you are. Heaven does not doubt that you are more than a conqueror. And what heaven is trying to do is to get us convinced in our mind that who Jesus says we are because of him, that's who we are. Knowing all these things. Now, the verse goes on and it says, knowing all of these things. So here's what he says. I just gave you a list of things. Danger, famine, uh, persecution, all of those things, right? In all of those things, when all of those things are present, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does that have to do with your situation? What does that have to do with all the things that, that I listed that we used to say that we're not more than a conquerors? He says, in all of those things, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, in all of those things, because of Christ, I am more than a conqueror. For I am convinced, <laughs> this is what he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth. It's like, it's like, listen, listen, I need you guys to understand something. Like he could have just said, nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? But he knew something about us that we would doubt that. So he made these two lists. And it's like, you think height or depth will separate you? Right, it won't. And then... It gets to the end of the list, and it's like, well, look, I, I didn't include everything in the list, nor anything else in all creation. Because you might have said, well, what I'm going through right now is not on his list. Right? So Paul said, yeah, my list is not complete. Here's how I complete it. I put everything down there. Right? So <laughs> all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, we change what we looked at at the beginning. No more question marks. No more question marks. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Don't let your opinion of yourself and certainly don't let Satan's opinion of you supersede Jesus Christ's opinion of you. Because Jesus Christ's opinion of you is the only thing, the only opinion that is rooted in ultimate truth. Yours isn't. Satan certainly isn't. Because the only thing he knows how to do is lie. One of the things that we need to do is meditate on truth. So, you're going to be getting a pulse this week sometime. One of the, one of the um, ways that helps me to meditate on truth is to listen to songs that are just scripture. Like, this is just scripture. And a while ago, Calvin wrote and sang a song. It's called, Who Can Separate Us from the Love of Christ? And he just repeats it. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And then he goes through the list. Shall tribulation, persecution, peril or the sword. And then he says, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. So all it is is the verses that we looked at in Romans 8, put to music and he sings it. It's a beautiful song. Beautiful song. And I have been driving in my car, listening to that song over and over again to let the truth of it sink in. We are more than conquerors. But it's important that we always understand the last part. It is through him, through him who loved us. So remember this. Whenever Satan tries to convince you that you are less than based on who you are, one of, the things that I'm, one of the things that I'm doing now is I'm agreeing with Satan like this. Wow, look at that. Look at what you've done. You just sinned. You know what? You're right. I did. But then, see, he doesn't stop there. He'll go, you just sinned. So that must mean you are. That's where I stop, stop the agreement. I just did that. I shouldn't have. But that doesn't mean that that's who I am. And the only way, Satan, that you convince, can convince me that I'm not more than a conqueror is you need to convince me that Jesus is not Savior, Redeemer, that he didn't die, that he didn't rise again. Satan, can you please convince me how I can be possibly separated from his love? Satan, can you please show me that he's not with me and for me? If you prove all of those things, and I'll agree with you and tell you that I'm not more than a conqueror. But if you can't prove that to me, all the rest of the stuff you're talking about, Jesus already told me is there. Told me that I'm not without sin. Told me that, you know, I'll have trouble in this world, so my circumstances might not always be right. Told me all of those things, but none of those things, Satan, I'm sorry, have anything to do with who I am. What has to do with who I am is Jesus Christ who loved us. Can we stand and let's pray together? Father, one of the things that I'm grateful for is my primary identity is rooted in you. But God, I confess that it is oftentimes hard for me to believe that I am who you say that I am. And God, I pray for anybody right now who is struggling with that, that they would meditate on your truth and to understand, God, that they're not that because of them. We're all of these things that you say we are because of Christ. And all of those things that we looked at about Christ are true, so therefore it's true what he says about us as well. Lord, we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus who loved us and who gave himself for us. Now, Lord, we pray that we would leave with your blessing but also leave with the understanding that even in all of those things that were listed, trial and, trials and all of that, in all of those things, we're more than conquerors in Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we go, everybody, on the count of three, I am more than a conqueror. But we, don't, we can't stop there. I am more than a conqueror. You have to say this, in Christ Jesus. Right? Because if you just say, I am more than a conqueror, the focus is on you. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Now say it like you mean it, or else you're going to have to say it again. Okay? Until you say it with confidence, you say it again. Everybody ready? One, two, three. I am more than Now leave today believing it and living it. Let's thank you. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.